John chapter five, starting in verse one. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the sheep gate, was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people lay on those porches, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, the addicted, the cynical, the gossips, the lazy, the workaholics. If I kept going, I'd get you. And that's kind of the point is that you find yourself in this story. We're gonna skip verse four and I'll explain why later and go straight to verse five. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, Jesus asked him, would you like to get well? And I wanna ask your permission to challenge you today. As one of your pastors, I wanna challenge you with the message called, You Can Change. It's been my sincere prayer all week that God would divinely persuade you deep in your heart that you can change if you want to. I wonder right now if you could bring to the forefront of your mind or imagination, maybe that one place or that one thing, call it that insecurity or that addiction or that anxiety or that depression, maybe that one thing that you're like, I I really wonder if God can change that one thing about me. You know, they say over the last few years, the most Googled concept on the internet has been, can I change? People are desperate to know, can I change this? Can I change that? I will have you notice something about Jesus' question though. He did not ask, do you want your situation to change? He asked, do you want you to change? Because we all know the breakthroughs we want in our lives, but we have a good father who knows the breakthroughs we need in our hearts. Can you change? I would argue God did not save you so that you wouldn't. You can change. So Holy Spirit, we love you. We invite you to have your way. Encourage us, challenge us, confront us, change us. If you want this sermon to to comfort us, let it comfort us. If you want us to feel so uncomfortable that we walk out of here and do something different, then I pray that would happen. We love you, we trust you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. So you're sitting in the middle of something much bigger than what you see. I just want you to know that about the Red Rocks Church story. Last week, our church in Austin turned five. So congratulations to all of you on being five. Great job. But today, Red Rocks Church as a whole turns 19 years old today. All right, so it started in Denver. In Denver, we have four campuses. We have a campus in Brussels, Belgium. We now have four campuses, GBB locations in different correctional facilities, three in Colorado, and now one in Texas. And now you're sitting in the middle of Red Rocks, Austin, our location in in Texas. And I say all of that, just in case you didn't know, you should know, but also to set the context for this story because I go to Denver to preach at those campuses once or twice a month. And a few months ago, I uh, I was getting ready to preach at our Littleton location and I was at the Starbucks down the street, just praying for you, don't mention it, I'm happy to do it, I really am. But this young lady, She's a red rocker and she just, she runs up to me, tears in her eyes and she goes, oh my gosh, pastor, I can't believe I'm running into you. I've never met you. Can I, can I give you a hug? And I said, oh my gosh, like get in here. Like give me a hug. What a moment. She said, your sermons, you just have to know your sermons mean so much to me. And I thought, what an honor to play such a pivotal moment in your life. It was such a pure and genuine moment. And then she said, and pastor, you have to know your book, Attacking Anxiety, has changed my entire life. Now, Sean Johnson is the global senior pastor of all of Red Rocks Church. He wrote Attacking Anxiety. He's 51, I'm 35. And I'm like, you think I'm Sean right now? Is my hair really that gray? You think I'm Sean? And Sean's a good looking guy, it's no secret, so I'll take it, but I am 16 years younger than him. I'm like, what does that say about me, you know? She said, will you sign my book? I said, absolutely, I'll sign your book. You got a pen? He has good plans for you. Global senior pastor, Sean Johnson. You know, she thought she just met Sean. I didn't wanna ruin the moment, you know? 
By the way, I'll sign all of your attacking anxiety books if you want. Just come find me in the lobby. I'll sign it for you. But I realized, man, I don't mind being Sean for an afternoon at the Starbucks down the street at the local Bucks. I'll be Sean all day, all day. Like the nicest thing you could say to me is to call me Sean. He's not just my pastor and my, my boss, but more important, he's one of my really good friends and he's one of the men that I just, I wanna, I wanna be like. Call me Sean all day long. I think that's why I like the New Year so much because all of us are in the process of becoming someone. The question really isn't who are you right now, it's who are you becoming. It has less to do with where you are right now and more to do with where you're going because you will get to wherever it is that you're going to. All of us are in the process of becoming. The reason I like January is because I get a chance to dream with some vision about who it is I wanna become so that I can start with the end in mind. What will be the story you'll tell? I made a list of good stories you could tell by the end of 2024. Here's just a few of them. I got closer to God this year. I read the entire Bible this year. I started serving. I joined a group. I led a group. I finally found the faith community I've been looking for. I started doing money God's way. I graduated FPU. I didn't just start it. I finished it. I made a budget. I got out of debt. I started giving. I went to rehab. I got sober. I started counseling twice a month. I forgave my dad, I faced the pain I've been running from, I did the deep work, I got out of that abusive relationship I've been stuck in, I got my confidence back, I learned a new language, I learned a guitar, I read 20 books, I lost 50 pounds, I ran 500 miles, I took my spouse on 25 dates, I memorized a new Bible verse every week and now I've got 52 of them cemented in my heart for the rest of forever. I broke free from pornography. I spent more time with my kids. There are so many good stories that you could tell by the end of this year and yet on the, on the same, the, the different side of that same list, there is another list of bad stories you could just as easily tell. I'm falling out of love with my spouse. Life got too busy for date nights. I did not foster my faith. It died little by little. I walked away from the church. That story happens all the time. I didn't take serious my circle, my community, and the people in my life pulled me away from God, walked away from the church. It happens all the time. I still haven't taken that leap of faith. I know God has put on my heart, and now yet another year has gone by. I didn't forgive. I got more resentment in my heart now. I feel it. Still haven't started counseling. I smoked 365 packs of cigarettes. I ate 365 Big Macs. I'm less healthy. I got more debt. I'm still living paycheck to paycheck because I still haven't made a budget. I'm still addicted. I got a new addiction. I'm more addicted. And my point is, if you can't be honest in church, you can't be honest anywhere. So we might as well talk about this because you know just as well as I do, those stories are easier to live than the good ones. What will be the story you'll tell? This is series about living by design this year rather than by default. So the story you tell at the end of this year is on purpose and not by accident, amen? Over break, I read this amazing book by Donald Miller called Hero on a Mission. And this book just talks about the brilliance of story, the art of story. And he talks about a few of the different main archetypes of characters and, and the, the three main archetypes in every single movie or you watch or book that you read are these. Number one, you have a victim. The victim is the one who feels helpless, powerless, meaningless, and stuck with no way out. In any movie, the victim does not change, nor does the victim help anybody else to change. Then you have the villain, the one who makes others smaller by way of attacking, manipulating, discouraging, and ultimately destroying. And then you have the victor or the hero, the one who faces the challenge and in doing so is transformed into a better version of themselves, the version of themselves that can overcome the challenge. By the way, the hero at the beginning of any movie is insecure, broken, and crippled by a paralyzing self-doubt. So if that sounds familiar to you at all, then that apparent setback might actually be God setting you up for the story he wants to write in your life this year. But what's interesting to me about movies is you have the, the victor and the villain both come from a background of being a victim. Both the hero and the villain have a backstory where something bad happened to them. But for the villain, they decided somewhere along the way, I'm gonna make as many other people feel the same pain as me as possible. The villain has 
Like Scar from the Lion King has a scar. That scar tells a story. Something happened that caused Scar to become the villain. That's why the devil is the ultimate villain of the story because he knows his end game is hell. And in the meantime, he's trying to take as many people as possible with him. But what's very interesting to me is that the hero or the victor oftentimes has a very similar background of being a victim in some way, shape, or form. Something bad happened. My favorite example of this has to be The Dark Knight, where the Joker and Bruce Wayne both have a story of pain as kids. One of them grew up to become the hero, trying to keep as many people as possible from experiencing what he had to go through, and the other one grew up wanting to watch the world burn. Here's why that matters. All of us have each of these characters within us. You and me both have a great capacity to play the villain and the victor. To quote the Apostle Paul, you have the flesh and you have the spirit. You have Cain and you have Abel. You have a great capacity to build up and at the very same time, you have a tremendous capacity to tear down. The villain and the victor living within you right now. How does that play out in life? Let's just get real with some examples for a second. At work, when your coworker gets the promotion and it's genuinely hard for you to celebrate them because of this scarcity, zero-sum terms mindset that believes if they win, then I somehow lose, that's the villain whispering to you, live from me, live from me. That's the reason we gossip, because just for a moment, it makes us feel like they're losing. So just for a moment, it makes us feel like we're winning. That's the villain saying, live from me. When you send that email, make that comment, have that conversation, and you, your, your motive is not constructive, but it's rather it's, I will be heard. My point will be made. They will feel. You're not doing that from the victor within you. That's coming from the villain within you. It's like when you live your whole life and work your whole life to prove the haters wrong. You're not living from the victor. You're living from the villain, and the story you're telling is not one of purpose, but rather one of proving a great capacity to play the victor and the villain. And yet at the end of the day, the real enemy to change for all of us is the temptation to stay the victim. So let me just be your pastor for a few moments because sometimes the same truth that offends the flesh is the very same truth that awakens your soul awakens your soul, because this is human. All of us understand this. And when I say victim, I am not speaking of that incident that happened to you. I'm speaking of an identity that you've adopted. I'm not talking about a moment. I'm talking about a mindset. You understand the victim mentality has very little to do with becoming a victim and almost everything to do with your decision to stay there. Like you wanna stunt your growth this year, self-identify as a victim and you will stay the same all year either because you don't believe you can change or somewhere deep down in your heart, if you're honest with yourself, you don't actually want to change. Erwin McManus has an amazing quote. He says, we all tell ourselves a story. I'm too damaged to ever be healed. I've made too many mistakes to make something of my life. I just can't catch a break. I would have accomplished so much if others hadn't held me down. I'm not talented enough to do something significant with my life. I don't have enough money to create wealth. I'm the victim of an unfair system. I'm too young to take on so much responsibility. I'm too old to start over again. The self-limiting stories we tell ourselves are endless. And that's why the question that Jesus asked this man was so good. Back to the story, this guy's been on his mat for 38 years, then all of a sudden Jesus shows up onto the scene and has the nerve and audacity to pull verse six on him. Here's verse six, once again. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? I used to think that was the stupidest question in scripture. I don't mean to be offensive, but I'm like, they say there's no such thing as a dumb question. I'm like, Jesus, another miracle, man. You just pulled it off. The world's first dumb question. Do you wanna get, what, what, are, you, like, what are you talking about? What do you mean, do I wanna? Like, what's the obvious answer, Red Rocks, when somebody shows up and says, hey, do you wanna change for the better? Do you wanna heal? Do you want to get well? Um, yes, Jesus, obviously. Next question, please. But look how this guy responds in verse seven. It's so honest, and I love him for it. I can't. 
I can't, sir. I can't, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. We'll get back to that. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. I can't. I can't. And the first thing you should notice is he has really good reasons. That's why I feel for him. That's why this is so tricky because everything he said was true. Uh, excuse me, Jesus, you got 12 friends. For 38 years, I've had nobody. I've had nobody to help me. And you come, you come talking, do you wanna get well? Are you kidding me right now? Do you have any idea how hard life has been for me? Do you have any? I've had nobody and absolutely everything he said is true. Just like every reason we would give God is completely true. Are you kidding me right now? Do you know how hard the last few years have been? You know what I've been through? You know that it wasn't me, it was the church that hurt me? It wasn't me, it was my boss who played the politics game. It wasn't me, it was, it was them who, who, who said the thing. It was that person who, who wronged me. You have any and everything that you would say is true. That's what makes this so tricky. Can I just validate that for you? I got no preacher tricks here. It's true. Jesus said in this world, you'll have trouble. That's what you're experiencing. It's true, it's true, it's true, it's true, it's true. And it's for that exact reason that when it comes to that thing, I actually don't know that you really wanna change because your reasons not to are too good. And this man, this becomes your identity. People know me as, as this person. 38 years, I've been right here. People know where to find me. This is, people ask me what happened and what's wrong. This is, I mean, and in order to get well, in order to heal, what if I told you people don't ask you what happened and what's wrong anymore? Do you believe you're worthy of a conversation that's bigger than what happened to you? You are, by the way. But man, this is, on this mat, I'm surrounded by a community of people who love me so much they let me stay in my dysfunction. And me playing small with my life and the potential God has placed within me gets romanticized on the mat because it's not me, it was the thing. What if I told you you had to confess in order to heal? But it's been like 10 years, man, since that thing happened and that would blow everything up. Do you really? It's a fair question, it's not a bad question. What if I told you in order to get well, you had to forgive? But you earned this blame mat. You've been paying the price to be mad for years. By the way, the price they should be paying, but you're paying. You earned this mat. And if you really believe that freedom was better than bitterness, you would have traded your bitterness for freedom by now. You gotta be so tricky with blame, man. So tricky with resentment because they wronged you and they became the victim in your story. But when you harbor that resentment, slowly but surely that resentment turns you into the villain, not of their story, of your own. Sum up all the scriptures in one word, not love, forgiveness. Because that's what love does at its best. Forgiveness is the highest level of living from the victor that there is. And forgiveness is the only possible way to keep the bad stuff that happens to you from writing the story you'll tell. It's the second most unfair thing I could ever say to you, and I understand that. By the way, the most unfair thing I could ever say to you is that an infinite and innocent God of the universe died on a cross to forgive your sin and pay for your failure and in exchange give you the righteousness that you would need for heaven forever then and there and open the door to life and life to the full for you in the here and now. Grace is so unfair. Thank God we don't get fair. You wanna talk unfair? Mercy and grace. The gospel is the most unfair thing you will ever hear spoken to you from this platform. The second most unfair thing is that the thing that happened to you, man, was not on you. That was on them. And God draws near to the brokenhearted and counts your tears. But what you do with it is it is on you. It has to be. It has to be. Jesus calls you more than a conqueror. If that's true, 
Apparently, you're not as stuck and powerless as you maybe thought just a few moments ago when you walked into this room. And by the way, your favorite movie character from your favorite movie, something bad happened to them at the beginning of the story that they had to overcome, and that's why they're your favorite. What will be the story you'll tell? And maybe it's not because we don't want to change. Maybe it's not because we don't really believe we can change. Maybe we do. Maybe we're just afraid to change. I know from firsthand experience, sobriety can be a lot scarier than addiction. And freedom will cost more from you than bondage will. And walking in the, the dreams God has given you takes more from you than playing it safe. I wonder if that's why we come back to our mats so often, because this is just an easier story to live. It's an easier story to live. I remember a pastor named Erwin McManus, the same guy from that quote. He said, we use cheesy Christian cliches to stay stuck in a victim mentality. Oh, if God wants it to happen, it'll happen, man. I'm sorry, but that is such passive Christianese garbage. Why is it that for the people who say, if God wants it to happen, it'll happen? It seems like God never wants anything to happen for them. <laughs> and yet for the people who like own it and say, God, what do you have for me? I'm stepping into it, I'm walking in it. God wants, that. God wants stuff to happen for them all the time. For my generation especially, man, I feel like we are stuck in sort of a God's getting me ready season. And there is absolutely that season where God's getting you ready. I'm just saying, it's like we're stuck in the cul-de-sac of it. And it's not a through street. Oh, one day God's about to do something big, man. He's about to, because it's safer as an idea because it requires nothing from you. They say this is the first time, at least in the history of our country, where our generation doesn't believe we can be more and do more than our parents. Oh, it's just too hard. I'm like, they got the ball here so that you could get the ball there for, for the next generation. Oh, once I'm healed, I'll help. Once I fully process all the pain, that's when I'll start to feel the joy that God has for me. Once the stars align, I'll pursue the dream that he's placed on my, as if your destiny is coming to find you here on the mat. Man, Jesus came to this mat to set you free so that you would stand up and walk in everything that he has for you. It's not a dumb question. It's a completely fair question. Do you want to change? What am I saying? I'm saying the real change for you with that thing, that thing, that thing, real change begins where your real excuses end. 38 years, 38 years, man. Here's another good question. Why did John give us such a specific number, 38 years? If he was just trying to make the point that it was a long time, he would have just said, guys, it was such a long time. But he said a specific number that to any Jewish reader would have also been a very significant number, 38 years. 38 years. 38 years. Deuteronomy chapter two, verse 14. 38 years passed from the time we left Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the Zered Valley 38 years is the exact amount of time that Israelites wandered in the wilderness. Two years of waiting, 38 years of wandering. There is something deeper all of a sudden happening beneath the surface of this story. I read a few commentaries early this week that said, essentially Jesus did not just go to the pool of Bethesda that afternoon to heal a guy. He was also trying to tell us a much bigger story and point us to something even beyond this, more corporate and universal than this one story for this one man. The pool of Bethesda means the pool of mercy, surrounded by five covered porches, representing the law, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, oftentimes called the Pentateuch, penta meaning five, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So what that means is everybody at the pool of Bethesda was beneath the covering of the law, and the law has zero power to save anybody. And if you were to show up at the Pool of Bethesda that afternoon, the scene would have preached to you that exact story. Oh, religion is powerless to do anything to set anybody free ever, ever. That's why it was 38 years between the time the Israelites were set free from Egypt and the time they started to live free in the promise. How many of us are living saved but not living free? Because we don't believe when it comes to that thing I can really change.
Remember when the man said, I've got nobody to help me in when the water bubbles up? He was referencing verse four, which we skipped earlier. The reason we skipped it is because verse four in John chapter five is not in the main part of your Bible, it's down in the footnotes because verse four was left out of a lot of the earlier manuscripts. Here's basically the summary of verse four. It describes this angel who from time to time would come down and stir the waters of the pool of Bethesda and once the waters were stirred, the first man or the first woman in would get their healing and salvation. A lot of scholars believe it was a superstition. Some believe it was real or it gave the appearance of healing, but nothing actually lasted. All you need to know is that it's a picture of religion, is it not? I mean, the first one in wins. The one with the best church attendance, the most accolades, the one who most earns it and deserves it, that's who gets salvation. That is relating to God by your worth. And he gives you your worth by your birth, not by your ability to earn it or impress him with your performance. What you need to know, what Jesus showed up onto the scene that day to represent is he ushered in a new era called grace that we no longer relate to God by religion and the law. We now relate to God by relationship and simply our faith in his grace. It is a a new era where God wants relationship with us. So he came to get you. Jesus finds this man and says, do you wanna get well? It's a Greek phrase, genesthe. And it's the same Greek phrase that he would drop just a few chapters later in John when he would out himself as the son of God by saying, truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. There's no tense to that. Genesthe is a part of speech called an infinitive. No past, present, or future, much like our God and his promises. So Jesus seems to be indicating something that has already occurred. Before the foundations of the world, the lamb was slain. And essentially what he says to this man is, are you ready to change the story that you've been telling yourself? Are you ready, so to speak, to become who you really are in Christ Jesus? Jesus is the beginning and the end, which means Jesus sees your end from your beginning. That's why he will call you righteous and blameless while you're still addicted, because he knows what you can be. He knows who you really are. He sees it, and he calls you by that name now. That's why he'll call you more than a conqueror while you're still on this mat with a victim mentality. The blood of the lamb is the power to change and the Christian life is no static life, Red Rocks. It is a dynamic one. The only question is, are you ready to stand up and walk in it? Donald Miller, also in that book, this is such a good question. I stole it from him, tweaked it a tiny bit. It's on the screen behind me. Here it is. If a movie was made about you this year, what would it be called? I got so many funny answers. I just can't give them in here. (laughs) The Hangover, Clueless, he's just not into you. Let's move on. (laughs) My movie from last year, if last year of my life was made into a movie, it would be called You Can Change. A few months ago, I preached to you guys the most vulnerable sermon I've ever preached called Drug of Choice. I talked to you about a nine-year prescription pain pill dependency that I walked in, and I, I remember calling Sean global senior pastor, Sean. And the day before I preached it, I was like, dude, how honest should I be with everybody? Because I don't wanna give the church reasons not to trust me as one of their pastors. And he said, dude, you know the drill. When it comes to vulnerability, it's so easy for preachers to be real about struggles from 15 years ago. And the worse, the better 15 years ago, because look what the Lord has done since. But what about today? He said, permission to be broken in front of our church. And I found out firsthand authenticity actually gives people more of a reason to trust you as one of their leaders. I have never received feedback like I have from that message, but I learned something last year that I would not have said a year ago at this time to say you can change. I might've said it about you because I'm polite and I, I really believe that, but about me with that thing, it was last March coming up on a year that I made a decision, if this is gonna change, it has to be now. That sort of desperation might be the best thing you could possibly feel walking out of church today, not comfort, desperation. 
It has to be this year. It has to be now, because I'm telling a different story. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word or the logos of our testimony. Well, here's mine. You can change, because God can change you. Now, it might take fighting. It might take apologizing and confessing and forgiving and counseling and then some more counseling. (laughs) But you can change because God can change you. And I thought back to last year because that was March that that happened. And I had tried so many times to walk away from this thing on my own. And it just, I got tired of failing at it. And God directed my attention back to last January. We did 21 days of prayer and fasting last January, just like we're doing now. That is accessing the power to change. It's the same concept as giving God the first 10 minutes of your morning, the first 10 cents of every dollar, the first consideration of every decision that you make, the beginning of your year. He just blesses and supernaturally supercharges the rest of it. And I learned what you can't do with willpower, you suddenly can do with God's power. You just need to access that power to change. And I know I would not be giving you the same testimony if it weren't for 21 days of prayer and fasting last January. I'm positive about that. And so I wanna challenge you once again and invite you into this. We have a QR code with tons of resources. If it sounds intimidating, we make it so approachable with baby steps to start. If it sounds challenging, it's supposed to be by design, but you can do tough stuff. You're made to do tough stuff. You are. Fasting awakens something in heaven that demands a response. Fasting, it changes things, man. This is for you. You can do this. If I can just, let me just push you and challenge you one more time, especially at the beginning of every year. I get so sick and tired of hearing people say like, I'm stuck and sort of talking. Remember that definition of a victim mentality? I'm powerless and helpless unless somebody else comes and rescues me. That sort of talk of, I know I need to get healthier, but I just, I don't have the energy or the know-how. I'm like, tell me what you mean by that. Well, I don't have the energy. Okay, well, you just need to start walking a little bit every day and let's get the mitochondria in your cells, the powerhouse of your body functioning with some energy because that energy is gonna help you change. Yeah, but I just, I mean, I don't have the know-how or the knowledge and nutrition and, and workout routines. Oh, do you have YouTube? Yeah, okay, then in 25 minutes, you can figure it out. You're not stuck. You're just, you're not powerless. With any, with any sort of, uh, of concept anymore. Like, I just, I don't know how money works in the real world, how to do taxes, how to make a budget. I don't know real estate or how to get into the housing market. How could I ever formulate my life with an ability to, to get my foot in the door and start making changes? How to invest, how to thrive in a social setting and have a good conversation with somebody face to face and how to be bold and encourage people, build people up and lead people. And I, and I go, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but do you have a smartphone? <laughs> then use it for something that's actually good for you, man. You're not stuck. You're not powerless. You're not helpless. And if I can bring this back to the sermon and spiritualize it with that thing in your life, it can change because God can change it. I'm telling you, fasting is available to you. All those resources available to you. I'm telling you, if you you spent just like one day or two days or three days where you just drank water, and you didn't eat food, but you got really hungry and desperate for God to move in your life. And a few times a day, you just fell to your knees and you asked God to change you. In three days time, you will realize just how not powerless you've been all along. I'm telling you, it's the power to change. Like Galatians 5.1 says, he has set you free already. He's already set you free. But then there's like an ownership shift where Paul then says, you've been set free, now walk free. Now live free and now don't run back to it anymore. Jesus is the ultimate victor, the ultimate hero of the ultimate story who saved us who were the victims of sin, were, past tense. You were dead in your trespasses. You were a victim of sin until Jesus did what he did for you that you could never do. And now he sees the end from the beginning and he'll call you a child of God. You are no longer a slave to fear. You're more than a conqueror. You're no longer powerless. You're no longer stuck because the blood of the lamb overcomes everything, everything. Stand firm, live free, for you are no longer covered by the law. You are now covered by grace, amen? Look at verse two one more time. The seemingly most boring verse in the story. Inside the city, near the sheep gate, was the pool of Bethesda 
with five covered porches. The pool of Bethesda means the pool of mercy. Five covered porches depicts a scene that is covered by the law, which is powerless, religion that is powerless. The sheep gate is where the sacrificial animals were brought into the temple to atone for sin. And so Jesus shows up to the pool of mercy covered by the law to fulfill it through the sheep gate. He himself as the ultimate, perfect, spotless lamb of God who would die the ultimate sacrifice once and for all in order to perfect some very imperfect people like this man, like me, and like you. And I just picture Jesus, he goes straight for this man. And by the way, this guy, I promise you, he's thinking, if there's one person on this planet God doesn't see, it's me. If there's one person God doesn't love, if there's one person God can never use or call his own, it's me. And Jesus showed up, stepped over every one of his real excuses and went straight for him. So if you feel any of those things, Jesus is coming for you today. He's coming for you today. And I picture him kneeling by this man and saying, you see this water, everything you think you're gonna find in it, it's not for you. And this mat where you find your identity and everything familiar, I wanna be that for you. I'm your salvation. I'm the living water who came to you because you could never get to it. And the final verse, verse eight. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. He did not just stand, he moved, he changed. I love how the Bible says at once he was cured. To me, he stands up in a moment. This is a picture of salvation. Salvation happens in a moment. You put your faith in Jesus and his grace to save you. It has nothing to do with what you did and everything to do with believing what he did for you and at once you're saved at once salvation happens. It's like Jesus said, stand up and become who you really are by the blood of Jesus. But the news doesn't stop there. It's like Jesus whispers, and now walk in everything I have for you. Become who you are positionally in Christ and now start living by everything you are practically in Christ. There is a person you already are and now you're learning to live like it's true. I see the end from the beginning. I know who you really are and I'm calling you that name now. So with that new name and new identity, follow me. In other words, your breakthrough is here. If you've been praying for one, stand in it. And your breakthrough is still on the way as well. Walk in it. Saw another sort of cliche, Christian cliche on a poster at Hobby Lobby last year. And uh, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. It's postable, it's cute. There's a lot of truth to it, especially the imperfect part, but just forgiven? So you're, so you're just forgiven then? Hey, this time next year, five years from now, I'll be, I'll be right here, same old prayer requests, same old struggle as I had five years ago. I, I, know, I know healings for me. I know there's more for me, but I, I, refuse to, I refuse to forgive. I refuse to confess. I refuse to repent. I refuse to make war against that thing. The same generational curses my parents passed to me, I'm passing to my kids, but I'm forgiven. We're all forgiven. I'm not downplaying forgiveness. It is the most beautiful gift from the most epic sacrifice in the history of the universe. But it is not your finish line, Christian. It is your starting line. And the grace that saves you is the same grace that wants to sustain you and change you. Can you change? Not just can you change, you must, you should. You're called to. And I believe by this time next year, that will be the story you tell is I can change because God can change me, amen? Guys, will you stand? I just believe there's a, maybe a lot of people in this room, maybe watching online, GBB, and today is your day. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. 
and you've never just given your heart and your life to Jesus. And he, he just like he had an appointment with this man 2,000 years ago, he's had an appointment with you and the appointment is today and it's right now. He's been beckoning you. He doesn't want religion. He's after relationship. There's no catch to this. You simply just say, God, Jesus, like forgive me of my sins. I give you my heart. I believe by faith in your grace, make me new, heaven forever, then and there, and I wanna walk with you and do life with you in the here and now, and immediately, scripture says, it happens immediately, and if that's you, I wanna invite you on the count of three to be bold and raise your hand and respond outwardly to a decision you're making in your heart. Number one, God loves you so much and you'll never be the same. Number two, your heart's beating and it's not because of a sermon, it's because the maker of the universe wants you to meet him today. This is your day, three. Just be bold and raise your hand. Today is the day of salvation. Raise your hand so I can pray for you, amen. Let's go, you guys, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, come on, let's go. Red Rocks, let's make some more noise than that because heaven's getting more crowded as we speak. Everybody online, ladies at GBB, all of you who just made that decision, congrats on the greatest decision that you will ever make, let's go. And then for the rest of us, man, like today is the day of salvation. I just believe with all my heart for our church, this could be for a lot of us, the year of rededication, a passion you haven't felt or walked in in far too long. Something that you've just, that chapter you've been rereading for far too long. This is the year of turning the page. This is the year uh, of getting serious about it, of fasting, of praying, uh, of praising him with some desperation, of approaching the throne of grace with confidence in just a minute. This is your year. What if I said like, it has to be this year, man. There is a grace on 2024 for change in our church. It's yours if you want it. Do you want to get well? Do you want to heal? Do you want to walk in freedom in everything that God has for you? Because I'm telling you, don't leave this. Stand up, pick up your mat and walk. For because of Christ, there is a miracle in you. Let that be the story you tell. Red Rocks, let's worship.